Good day. Today I'm going to be talking to you about the work that we are doing to try and save the blue swallow in KwaZulu-Natal, um, what has been done, what we are doing, and what needs to, to be done going forward. So before we start, just a little bit about who is doing this work. Um, my name is Steve McKean. I'm with Conservation Outcomes. We're an NGO, a small NGO, and we are working in close part in, 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 a, in a partnership with BirdLife South Africa to do the blue swallow work and habitat conservation work in Cousin Natal. And in doing that, we work very closely in collaboration with Ezembele or Cays and Wildlife. Um, my partner in crime is Brent Coverdale, and we work very closely together on blue swallows and monitoring and habitat conservation. Just to give you an idea for those of you who are not familiar with where any of this, where we are working, um, basically we are working in the Midlands of KwaZulu Natal in South Africa, and as can be seen where the green arrow of this map is, where roughly where it is, and that's the blue swallow habitat roughly in the province, where in the KwaZulu Natal Midlands, misbuilt. So for those of you who don't know much about blue swallows, um, I'm going to give you a very quick blue swallow 101. They're a very distinctive iridescent metallic blue swallow. It's a beautiful little bird. They're an intra-African little mi migrant spending summers in South Africa and winters in East Africa. They favor high altitude grasslands with a, with a high rainfall. They are carpenter breeders. And in South Africa, they bring, breed in sinkholes, abandoned mine shafts, and very often in artfark holes. So the presence of artfarks are actually quite important for these birds. They lay three eggs. And in a good season, they'll, ra they'll lay up to three clutches per season, but normally two, so two to three clutches. So from finding a nest hole, and you can see roughly where that hole is, where the cap is in that picture, just below that, you'll see a sort of a shadowy black area. That is a nest hole. Um, quite hard to find often. Um, from In about 28 days from finding a hole, they have a nest built. 14 to 17 days after that, they have eggs laid. Then and, and chicks had that have hatched. And then in 20 to 26 days after that, we have fledged chicks that, that are coming out of that nest, all going well. The current conservation status of the species is globally, its conservation status is vulnerable. And they're roughly um, a range of, of a maximum of about 1,240 pairs, according to, to Stephen Evans in 2015. However, if you consider that each one of those rhinos represents a thousand rhinos in the world, this is how many blue swallows we have in comparison to the number of rhinos we have in the world. And rhinos, we all know how threatened they are. But this gives you an idea on how, in, in relative terms, how threatened these birds are. Um, that is in South Africa. Uh, you know, that, that's globally. And in South Africa, they are considered critically endangered. And if that's how many rhinos we have with each animal representing a thousand rhinos there on the diagram, we have a half a blue swallow in, 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 in relative terms to how many blue swallow, uh, rhinos we have. And at the moment, we estimate somewhere between 30 and 35 and 50 pairs in South Africa, less than 250 individuals. So they're in a bad way. So why are we in, the, why are we in this predicament? Well, the primary reason is the loss of its grassland habitat. And that's through historically through afforestation, um, not so much lately, but then I do believe that we are hearing rumors of, of more catchments being opened for more timber, which is not good news for these birds or their habitat. Um, but we'll have to see what happens with that. Agricultural development has been hindered by the loss of timber plantations. We've had agricultural development, which has changed, which has transformed their habitat. Rural housing growth, as you can see on the top of the, on the right of the diagram there. And then the mismanagement of grasslands, as in the bottom left hand diagram left and pretty severe mismanagement on the left of that fence line. Our grasslands have been steadily eaten away um, through these land modification processes. That's what our grasslands and natural habitats looked like in 1990. 2017, that is what they look like now. And if you move on to the mist belt, 1990, that's what it looked like with those dots being blue swallow areas and nests. To 2017, and it has degraded and, and changed a lot more since, in the last four years since 2017 as well. So we are losing our habitat at, at quite a rate. Blue swallows do have a biodiversity target. It's a probably, in reality, a pretty unrealistic one. And, and these, that is around about 80 active nests by 2020. We have missed that target. Um, we only have about 40 active nests at the most that we know of in the province. 
um, and probably not many more in Pumalanga. And so we've missed that. So this needs to be revised. And with a target of, of, of 156 nests by 2040. So it's highly unlikely we will get to that. And this will probably need to be revised. But having said that, you aim high. So we, we've got to aim high. What are we actually doing? Well, we're monitoring. Um, many people might say, well, how's monitoring helping? But if you don't measure, you don't know. If you don't know what you're dealing with, you can't save the species. So we have to monitor what is happening, where these birds are. We monitor the number of active nests and their locality, private versus protected areas. On that point, 99% of these birds are located in private and communal areas. Only in Pentley and Nature Reserve as a state-run area has blue swallows in it. Um, and that population as of last year is declining quite rapidly and, and we don't know why. Something we need to look into this year. Um, we monitor the number of eggs, number of chicks, number of fledglings, changes in habitat. And then before the birds arrive back here in early, late September, early October, we go and we prepare the nest sites where we can, um, making sure we get rid of debris, um, alien, any sort of plant blockages, alien plants and all that kind of stuff. And you can see some pictures of the work that we're doing there. So, as I said, we're monitoring and this is often what happens. You head out early in the morning and you hit this on the road on your way to monitoring. So you then have to turn back. So it can be quite sporadic and unreliable. Um, and then we have to deal with the weather as well. So um, um, it, it's not a perfect situation, but we have to make the best of what we, what, what we have and, and, and make the best of the time that we have. Population trends in KwaZulu-Natal, um, this bird has been monitored to, to greater or lesser degrees of success for, for many years now, since probably the late 1980s. Um, and a good monitoring effort in the early 90s. But you can see we've got an overall declining trend since the mid, mid to the early 2000s. Um, and the number of eggs is declining with, with a little bit of an increase being shown in the last couple of years. Similarly for the number of chicks, and then again for the number of fledglings. Um, they are seeming to, to be on the up a little bit, but we're not sure whether that's because we have an, an intensified monitoring effort in the last couple of years compared to what we did have in 2016 where there was no monitoring or whether the birds are actually now doing better. Um, we have come through a drought period. The last couple of years we've had good rains and last monitoring season was a good one with, with good breeding. Also doing some niche modeling. We are identifying potential nesting areas and we're surveying modeled areas to find new nesting areas. Um, and that has met with some success. We have located a few nest holes that we didn't know about before that have been active, particularly down in Mzimkulu and um, one notable one at Rosen's Nature Reserve, which we didn't know about, which we've <coughs> identified. Um, so we then that's right, that's the monitoring side. What are we doing in terms of habitat conservation? Well, we're working with private and communal landowners to conserve blue swallow habitat and misspelled grasslands um, through the biodiversity stewardship mechanism. It is a very successful mechanism. It works. And I'm not going to go into detail about it now, but it basically offers four options and uh, for participating landowners. And it's shown in the diagram on the right. It has legal backing through the Protected Areas Act in South Africa and the Biodiversity Act. The categories offer different levels of security and different levels of commitment and, of, and from landowners. And at the same time, they attract different incentives and benefits depending on uh, the level of commitment of the landowner. All options are voluntary, very important, very important. Um, nobody forces anybody to do anything here. Um, and landowners retain full title and ownership of their properties. And, they, and the management of the properties is done in terms of a management plan, um, which is drawn up with, with landowners to manage these, the, 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 Blue swallow and their misspelled grassland habitat. Uh, where are we working in KZN? Again, I've, as I said, in the misspelled grasslands, which is roughly in the area of, of that blue circle, of the red circle. Um, it does extend up and towards Zululand, but this is where we're currently working at the moment. Um, we don't have records of blue swallows up there in Zululand area for many, many years, um, but we will be checking again this year, particularly in, in these sort of areas that, that I'm pointing to here. And then we've have had a couple of areas declared in the last couple of years, Tali Tullam Nature Reserve being a noteworthy one near Pentley, 
another noteworthy one being Trewergi, um, near the banks of the Tweed area. Minerva, which is also there, which is not, it's a declared protected area in terms of the provincial ordinance, but we're busy doing a verification and validation process for Minerva to get it declared in terms of the Protected Areas Act. That's very significant. Um, Roselands, which is currently probably the blue swallow capital of South Africa, five nesting pairs in it, extremely important area for these birds. That was declared in, in early, in, in around about 2008. Um, Lake Reserve. And then we're currently working on an area called Neroda, a small grassland area with nesting blue swallows in it near Kopo. And then Rilton Nature Reserve, SAPI owned, also um, declared in the last year or two um, near Ikopo. And then lastly, Sunnyvale, which we're still busy working on. That is probably the southernmost distribution of blue swallow in, in, in Africa. Two or three nesting pairs there, not yet declared um, for various reasons, which I'm not going to discuss now. But we are still monitoring there and we are working with the landowner to try and secure this area. Just to give you some idea on what these areas look like, with Tuergi, Tilly Tudlam, Roselands, Sunnyvale, Wilton, and Naroda, um, and showing the area sizes. These small, these area sizes are small because that is the nature of Mistbark grassland in, in KwaZulu Natal. There, there's not big swathes of it left, and we have to try and secure the little pieces that do still exist. To declaring new protected areas and working with landowners, the important work starts after declaration and in terms of supporting landowners. Landowners are not generally protected area managers and they have not been trained to do this, so they do require and they do desire the support that we try and offer them. Um, and this includes things like complying with management with the Protected Areas Act, providing ecological advice and support through annual, annual management meetings, uh, fell condition assessments, and, and so forth. We do help with pre burn inspections um, in terms of getting the fire regimes right um, on the properties, which is very important for misbelt grassland and blue swallows, and then um, assisting to fight invasive alien plants in these grasslands, with bramble being a main one. And we are currently facilitating a herbicide assistance program. And then the other stuff that we do in terms of presentations, like this one, we write popular articles, we do publish on social media of what we're doing. And then we do assist with permitting advice to landowners where it's required. In addition to this, we need to answer the unknowns. It's all very well doing what we are doing in KwaZulu Natal and, 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 and in Pumalanga, but what happens to these birds over, over winter? Have their migratory routes become compromised? Is the rest of the global population secure and conserved? We're doing things here, but what's happening elsewhere? Um, and what happens to each year's offspring? We don't know the answers to any of these things, and there are strategies and plans afoot to, to work with our African partners in, in, in the East African states in particular to, to get answers to these and to reignite and, and, and reinstate blue swallow work in those areas. Moving forward, we will be expanding monitoring and surveillance into Mpumalanga and Mpopo this year through some funding through the IUCN, which is great. Um, and we are busy finalizing the biodiversity management plan for the species. We are securing additional breeding sites to the stewardship program. That is an ongoing thing. Continuing support for those existing sites. Continuing to raise awareness and extension about the species and its habitat to landowners. And um, continuing surveillance of nesting areas to ensure optimal conditions for nesting. And of course, as I've just been speaking about, to answering the unknowns. And finally, to acknowledge um, our partners in this work, um, the photograph credits. To our monitors throughout KwaZulu Natal, there are several of you, many of whom are volunteers. You know you are. Huge thank you to you all. We wouldn't be able to do this without you. And we gratefully acknowledge, of course, very importantly, the supporters of this work, and they are all shown below. Thank you very much.